The New Orleans Pelicans control their own destiny for the sixth seed, and I'm going to tell you how maintaining their team identity, which you saw in the win over the Trailblazers, is the key to holding their playoff spot. It's the Wednesday episode of Locked on Pelicans. Let's go. You are Locked on Pelicans, your daily New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another edition of Locked On Pelicans, the daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Pelicans and NBA. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, available wherever you get your podcasts and available on YouTube. I'm your host, Pelicans Insider, credential member of the media, Jake Madison, at Nola Jake on Twitter. Here with y'all after the Pelicans beat the Portland Trailblazers 110-100, and they got a lot of help. And they're now in the sixth spot and they control their own destiny going forward. We're going to look at that, what that means for New Orleans, what they need to get done and how the other teams in the standings can help them out in the first part of the show. I then want to look at this win over Portland, the team identity. Defense to offense coming out in the second half, and then you got really strong performances from C.J. McCollum and Trey Murphy as well. So we're going to break it all down here in today's episode of Locked On Pelicans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And of course, thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We are here Monday through Friday, the number one Pelicans podcast covering everything you want to know about this team, the wins, the losses, the schedule going forward. We'll be looking at the draft, the offseason, free agency, all of those. So please subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Join almost 10 thousand other Pelicans fans on YouTube as well. And of course, thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen every day. If you're an everydayer, that means you listen Monday through Friday. If you are, let me know in the comments down below. If you're not, this is a great time to start listening. So Tuesday night went like literally about as good as it could have gone, as well as it could have gone for New Orleans. They moved into the sixth seed after the Los Angeles Clippers beat the Phoenix Suns. So the updated NBA standings right now are New Orleans in the sixth spot, a game up on Phoenix, two games up on the Sacramento Kings, uh, two and a half games up on the Los Angeles Lakers, and then the Golden State Warriors in 10th don't really matter here. New Orleans at this point is most likely going to finish Six or seventh, but they control their own destiny for the sixth seed. There are three games remaining, and if they win out, if they win all three of those games, well, they are the sixth seed, and then even if Phoenix wins out, they're going to then be the seventh seed and have to go in through the play-in tournament. So New Orleans is in a good position here to avoid all of that because while there are some decent teams on their schedule, all of these games are very winnable. Next up is the Sacramento Kings on the front night of, a back to, uh, of the back-to-back against the Golden State Warriors. Then you have the Los Angeles Lakers at home. They're 4-0 against the Sacramento Kings. That might be the toughest game to me. I think it's tough to beat a team five games in a row and they're kind of fighting for their playoff positioning lives here. But by the time you get to the Golden State Warriors the next night, they might be locked into the 10th spot and might not really need anyone playing in that game. But also, they're not that great this year. And then going into the final day of the regular season, the Lakers might be locked into the 9th spot or whatever their playoff position might be. And so they may rest people against the New Orleans Pelicans. So New Orleans, with this Tuesday night, by getting into pole position for this, is in a really good spot compared to where they were just a week ago. Shows you how tight things are in the Western Conference, but by the same mindset, you lose to the Sacramento Kings, you probably drop down to seven, and now you're not only behind the Phoenix Suns, but you're only a game up then on the Sacramento Kings. That means you need to then for sure, most likely, win the final two games against the Warriors and the Lakers. So we really might not know where the Pelicans are going to end up until the final day of the regular season ends. So maybe on Sunday. Coincidentally, the next day, on April 15th, tax day, Monday, there are no games. The playing tournament is going to start on the 16th, the next day, with New Orleans potentially hosting a game. We've got a live in-person recording episode that we're going to do of Locked on Pelicans at Mid-City Yacht Club in conjunction with the Pels 12. Mid-City Yacht Club, April 15th, 7 p.m. Aaron Summers is going to join me on there as a guest. Ralph Myers is going to join me as a guest. I have another guest lined up that as long as he's not traveling for that, and it's looking good now, that... He will also be a guest on the show as well. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Come hang out in person. We're going to break down, you know, the play in tournament game potentially for the Pelicans, how they win, how they might lose, all the things you need to know with that or a potential playoff series. So it's going to be a lot of fun. But with basically every team losing 
that New Orleans needed to lose. The Kings lost to the um, Oklahoma City Thunder. The Lakers lost to the Golden State Warriors. Just a great Tuesday night for New Orleans. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, right? And New Orleans, in this case, was both, actually. Getting a lot of luck with those other teams losing. You don't control that sort of thing. But now also winning themselves and it took a little bit to get going and we'll break that down coming up here in the next segment in a moment in today's episode of locked on pelicans so right now if the playoff standings hold and we don't know that even if the pelicans get in as the sixth seed who they're going to play at the top of the west y'all is just still undecided it's wild to me that the boston celtics are 14 games up on the second place milwaukee bucks the minnesota timberwolves and denver nuggets are tied tied for first in the Western Conference with Minnesota having that one spot, Denver two, and then Oklahoma City Thunder just one game back in the three position. The Pelicans could play any of those teams. I think Minnesota is the one you really like. If the Pelicans hold at six, you'd like them to drop to three. I don't know the tiebreaker scenarios with them. I'll look at those and maybe give you an update on that coming up in tomorrow's episode of Locked On Pelicans. But those are likely as of today, and it could change. One of the one of the three teams that New Orleans is going to end up playing. But again, just get in. Just get in. We've seen how dangerous the playing tournament can be for certain teams. Remember the Pelicans taking on the Clippers. They were the night seed. They beat the San Antonio Spurs. Go on the road to L.A. and Paul George is ruled out with COVID, I think it was. Just a fluke thing that happened that let New Orleans get that victory. After they built a big lead, lost it, came back to win it in a close game. Paul George is there. Who knows how different that is? You don't want to be in one of those fluky scenarios. That's why, look, even if it's Denver is the three seed and the Pelicans the six seed, I don't want to go through the play-in tournament. I'd rather just get a series. As simple as that. And I think that's the goal for New Orleans. Get yourself at least four postseason games as opposed to maybe just one, two, depending on how it goes, in the playing tournament. That is a real dangerous game to play for playoff seeding, positioning like that with how things could go in the playing tournament. We all thought they were going to beat the Oklahoma City Thunder last year, and that didn't end up happening either. And we saw how just kind of distraught, exhausted everyone was at the end of all of that. Let's avoid all of that. Just get in. And let's get excited, give them a couple days of rest and things like that to game plan for their opponent, which they wouldn't be able to do otherwise by going through the play-in tournament. And that means we'll just have more to talk about at the live show as we look at an actual playoff series when it comes to all of that. So coming up next, let's look at the actual game. I know the, the playoffs and the standings and controlling their destiny in the sixth seed is the big story, but how the Pelicans won this game is emblematic of who they are, and they're going to need this these next three games too, so it's really important. That's coming up here next in today's episode of Locked On Pelicans. Right now, though, I'm excited to tell you about game time because, look, it can be frustrating buying tickets, especially if you're wanting good seats, wanting to get them at a great price. You don't know. It's, it's a hassle. I hate that sort of feeling. Game time takes the uncertainty out of buying tickets. There's no frustration. And now game time is also an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which, make, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. So prices on the game time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. I use game time for all my ticketing needs now. I've bought courtside Pelicans tickets to go and watch them play. I've bought Saints tickets for when they're on the road and at home as well. The prices are great. And what I love is you get to see the view from your seat before you buy. It's a stadium you've never been to. Is the view good? You'll actually be able to know and make an informed decision when buying on game time. They also have last minute ticket deals. You can save up to 60% when buying last minute, whether it's sports, concerts, comedy, theater. Last minute, you're not sure if you want to go to the game against the Lakers on Sunday? Wait, see what the prices are in game time. You're going to see a deal you like and we'll see you in the Smoothie King Center. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game, with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code Locked on NBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account. Redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-B-A for $20 off. Download the GameTime app today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. 
And thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We're here Monday through Friday, even when I'm on the road in a hotel room, even if it doesn't look like it, breaking down everything you want to know about the team, the number one Pelicans podcast. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcast. We are also available on YouTube where there's almost 10,000 other Pelicans fans. Again, I'm going to keep plugging this until Monday, and you're going to even hear it on Monday on that episode of Come to the Live Show, Mid City Yacht Club, where the Pels 12 does their watch parties. There will be a watch party for every away game there in the postseason whatever that looks like come hang out meet other pelicans fans come talk to me aaron summers other media members are going to be there as well it's going to be a lot of fun i'm excited for it i hope you show up it's going to be kind of a little pep rally we'll preview everything come hang out maybe i'll even buy you a drink if you come up to me and and say that i'll probably buy you one we're going to try and get some drink specials and other things too there's going to be raffle prizes it's just going to be a real fun night and i'm looking forward to doing the live q a after the live episode of locked on pelicans with all of y'all so subscribe tell a friend about the show too right like this is the time to get him clued in on what's going on with this pelicans team because they're looking like they're going to be right now in the actual playoffs and getting a full series what are they good at what are they not we cover it all here we'll get them set up for everything we'll have crossovers with whoever they're playing as well so make sure your friends are also subscribed to locked on pelicans part of the locked on podcast network your team every day Okay, so let's get into the 110-100 win over the Portland Trail Blazers. It was a slow start for New Orleans. They came out a little bit sluggish. The offense was kind of stuck in the mud a little bit. They seemed like just out of sorts with what Portland was doing, which was playing zone defense. You know, they were losing, the Pelicans were, at halftime in this one and couldn't really find a way to get Zion going. You had C.J. McCollum shooting the ball well and kind of carrying the team. And frankly, them being down by as few as they were in that game at halftime is, it felt like a little bit of a miracle. But you also kind of knew that this team is better. Like, this was a better team. So if they go out and just kind of stay the course, they're going to be able to overcome that three-point deficit and win this game and just go back to being who they were. And who they are and who their identity is, whether this is intentional or not, is as a defensive team right? This is a team that wants to go out there, force turnovers, then get out and run in the second half. And while they forced a good bit of turnovers, eight in the first half for the Portland Trailblazers, it was the second half, particularly that third quarter when they really got it going. And once they started doing that, poking the ball loose, Portland had six turnovers in both the second, or sorry, the third and fourth quarters here, they were able to get out and run. And it doesn't matter what defense you're throwing at them there because it's transition defense. I'm going to sneeze. It's not nearly as good as anything else. Sorry about that. I actually can mute that right here with what I've got set up. So when you can get out and run and get those fast break points, those points off turnovers, it just punishes teams. On the night, Portland had 21 turnovers. New Orleans turned that into 33 points. They had 17 fast break points compared to just four for the Portland Trailblazers. When you need a boost of offense, first force a turnover and get out and run. And you saw everyone contributing in this way, particularly Herb Jones. We already know that, right? With his play and leading this Pelicans defense now to the postseason, to a top 10, top 5 defense, I'll look tomorrow and see what it is. He probably should be in the running for Defensive Player of the Year. He had two steals in this game that led to really easy buy buckets for New Orleans. We'll probably do a show about his candidacy, looking at it compared to others as well. When it comes to that, he's almost certainly, I think at this point, going to make first team all defense. I would be shocked if he was even on the second team, but he's going to get that kind of award. But I think he should get some votes for defensive player of the year. He has been that good, but that's probably going to go to Rudy Gobert, who's been anchoring a very good defense as well. And it tends to go more big men in general, than it does to wing players or backcourt players. But Herb Jones, with what he was doing, was fantastic. Trey Murphy, who we're going to talk about in the next segment too. You know, we're going to talk about a scoring 31 points, leading score for New Orleans. He was really good defensively in this one as well. Everyone was, right? Every single starter tallied a steal here, at least two, right? And you had Zion Williamson was the only guy. Sorry, not everyone did. Oh, Zion Williamson did not. He had one. Everyone else had two. Off the bench, Larry Nance Jr. intercepting the ball with two. Jose Alvarado with one. Dyson Daniels with one. That's what this team kind of really thrives on. 
on. Their identity is defense turning it into offense, which then lets them get back and get set because teams now have to inbound the ball, so they're not running in transition against you. So you get an easy bucket because transition, you score more efficiently, you get more points, it's easier to score in transition than the half court. Your defense then can run back, get set, while the other team has to inbound the ball, bring it up the court, you force another turnover, and the cycle keeps repeating itself. This is how defense leads to good offense, but also how good offense leads to even better defense by letting your team get back, get set, and into what they want to do. And you saw it from the Pelicans in this game entirely. So that is their identity. They're going to need that in the next couple of games. This game swung once they started playing some defense. It was entirely that. We know that Trey Murphy was going to get some points. We knew CJ really had it going in this game. More on them again in the next segment here. But this game was one when they started getting stops in the third quarter. It was at that point where you go, oh, this game's about to swing, right? They had 35 points in the third quarter, a lot of that in the fast break in running, and Portland had just 23. So you go from being down three to up nine in one quarter, and that was the swing. And at that point, Portland was never going to get back into this one. They were also shooting abnormally hot in the first half particularly from three, that was going to regress and kind of adjust itself a little bit. They were hitting a lot of shots, 55.8% from the field in there, 37% from three. That definitely was going to swing and change. And once that happened, 31% from three, 38% from the field, you knew that New Orleans was going to take charge of this game. It was a little more stressful, particularly in the first half that we than we would have liked. But once they got back to being who they are, they won this game. You also, in this one, got good performances kind of out of all of your your big men. I don't think Larry Nance Jr. was as effective in this game as, say, Jonas Valanciunas was. And this is kind of showing you the, the problem with their center position. There's certain matchups where Larry Nance Jr. is ideal. There's some where Jonas Valanciunas is going to be better. And in this case, it was here. He didn't shoot the ball particularly well, just 5 for 12. You saw DeAndre Ayton give him a lot of trouble, I thought, and kind of push him away from his spots just a little bit. But you could run the ball through him. Five assists from Jonas in this one. Eight rebounds were important. And he did score 11 points, and they needed that sort of thing. But just being that big body down there, using him in pick and rolls as the screener, things like that, simple actions, simple basketball, led to really good things. I don't think Jonas is the answer all the time. You're going to see Larry Nance Jr. in the playoffs more, you know, definitely depending on the matchup. But there's times when Jonas Valanciunas is going to be valuable. It also speaks to why they need to solve that issue this offseason. You have, if you have two guys that are like good situationally, do you really have anybody? And I think that can be a problem for the Pelicans too. But this game, they managed it really well. You even saw Jonas Valanciunas closing the game out late fourth quarter minutes for Jonas. I couldn't even tell you the last time he did that. And so he played how much in the f- fourth quarter here? Oh, they put him in for two minutes, 20 seconds. That's really good for him there. They don't normally, you don't normally see that from him here. So seeing late fourth quarter minutes for Jonas Valanciunas was encouraging because it means Willie Green knew what was needed from this team, had the right read on the team here. And I thought he had the right read on the team entirely. One of the things they were doing to get some of those turnovers, which I thought was great, was they were sending a lot of traps, double teams, but late in the shot clock. So if you had, you know, a great example was when Herb Jones intercepted a ball I sound like he's like an NFL player, like a safety, but he was looking like Ed Reed out there. You know, they had they had DeAndre Ayton out in the short left corner. They threw, you know, his man's in front of him. He's trying to figure out what to do. There's about eight seconds left in the shot clock. I think Dyson Daniels comes over to double team him too. And now he has to pass out of that. Otherwise, it's going to be a turnover. But with the clock running down, he's stressed about this, really trying to figure out exactly what to do. And he makes a bad pass that Herb Jones then just grabs. Ended up in a foul. Um, so it didn't lead to fast break points, but it's points off turnovers later that New Orleans got from that sort of thing. So Willie Green kind of instructing his team on when to send double teams. And Herb Jones just being innately good at that. That's something that he just does, goes, hey, we're going to get this guy on this play, right? They did that in that game against the Milwaukee Bucks where he told Zion, let's go and blitz Damian Lillard right now and try and force him into a turnover, and it happened. Or you saw Herb Jones doubling off of Devin Booker, which is insane, to go get a steal on Bradley Beal when Zion was defending him well. This team defensively knows what they're supposed to be doing and instinctually they've kind of got it drilled into them. And that's what this team's identity is, being defensive, forcing turnovers, then getting out and running. They're going to need to do that against the Sacramento Kings. You're going to need to do that against the Golden State Warriors. And you absolutely are going to need to play defense like that against the Los Angeles Lakers. So if they stick to their identity, what they're good at, what they're known for, 
this team can go 3-0 and and solidify their spot in the playoffs with the sixth seed. So coming up next, let's talk about Trey Murphy, CJ McCollum, because both were excellent in this game, and you're going to need that going forward, too. That's coming up here next in today's episode of Locked on Pelicans. Today's episode of Locked on Pelicans is brought to you by BetterHelp, and I've got to pull up the copy here, and I apologize for all of that here. Um, So yeah, today's episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Sometimes we need the opportunity to get something off our chest. Big or small, certain things can really start to get to you, so it's important to let that out, especially to someone who's unbiased in your life. So today, I want to say how I really feel about something. You might even be thinking about the same thing this week. Right before I recorded this show in my hotel room, the fire alarm went off. Go down the stairs because you've got to do all of that. Get to the lobby and they go, oh, hey, no, it's just a false alarm. We burned some wings cooking food for someone here. You can go back up to your room. Can they just say that so we don't all have to go down? Could they make an announcement or something like that? It's going to almost disrupt the show here right? So therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports teams, and it's important to get things off your chest every once in a while. So if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnNBA to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOnNBA to get started. And thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. And join almost 10,000 other Pelicans fans on YouTube, the number one Pelicans podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every day. And come to the live episode of Locked On Pelicans Monday, this coming Monday, 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 April 15th, 7 p.m. at Mid-City Yacht Club in Mid-City. We're going to be there with the Pels 12 doing a live in-person episode. It will be, if the Wi-Fi is good enough, we're going to try and live stream it on YouTube as well. It's going to be a lot of fun. Great guests, Aaron Summers, Rel Myers, one or two others as well. And then we're going to do a live Q&A where you can ask questions to us about the playoffs, whatever it might be. We're going to get you set for the postseason with a live episode of Locked on Pelicans and I cannot wait. So I hope to see y'all there. Mid-City Yacht Club, 7 p.m. April 15th. So let's talk about Trey Murphy, CJ McCollum here and their performances in this game. The first half, it was it was really CJ McCollum getting it going. You know, he's had a lot of success, <laughs> mildly putting it, in Portland. He knows how to shoot there. And in the first half, he had 17 points. He was three of six from deep. He's been playing really well. I know a lot of people really don't like his style of play, but I tried to explain it after the Suns loss. Him taking those early jumpers in transition is by design. Him taking those threes early on in the shot clock, if you're going to play drop coverage, that punishes that drop coverage and gets them to stop doing that, which opens things up for Zion Williamson later. It's tweeted by Will Guillory. C.J. McCollum in his last 13 games, including this game against Portland, 25.5 points, 4.5 rebounds, 5.5 assists, 46.4% from the field, 44.6% from three. He scored at least 29 points in each of his last four games. He's playing really well. He has played really well all season long. And again, with Zion out there, with Jose Alvarado back, shifting him into a little bit more of an off-ball role, but giving him that ball in his hands to run pick and rolls, test that drop coverage, burn that drop coverage, if they try and do that, right? You saw DeAndre Ayton kind of hang him back. Okay, so he's just going to shoot. And when he shot like he did in this game, teams are going to have to start to defend differently. This is how you space the court for Zion Williamson. It's not just by putting shooters out there. It's how you punish the defense for what they're doing. Five of ten from three is certainly going to do that. Four of four from the line. He's been aggressive too. He had five shots that weren't threes that he made. Getting downhill, attacking the basket. He's seeing those creases, and he's getting the ball up and laying it off the glass really well. He has a floater, which works about half the time, which could be good or bad, depending. He's played really well. You want him taking these kind of shots because it makes life easier for Zion Williamson. And this wasn't the easiest game for Zion. Just 22 points on 18 shot attempts is bad for him. Those 8 of 9 from the uh, free throw line, which is good. So you need CJ in that scoring, and CJ is only going to be even more of a threat once Brandon Ingram comes back, which is hopefully going to be sooner rather than later. We might have even another update tomorrow that I'll give you as well. And then you have Trey Murphy, who was just frankly awesome in this game. 31 points, the leading score for the New Orleans Pelicans, but he did everything here. He did everything. 5 of 12 from deep, 42%. 
9 of 17 from the field, 53%. Those are excellent numbers. Eight rebounds. You know, rebounding was an issue for him. He wasn't as aggressive on the boards as you would have liked to see him earlier on in the year. But he's clearly putting the work in and trying to find that aggression to be able to go and get those boards. Eight rebounds. This team desperately needs more rebounding because they want to play small. We saw them go with Zion at the five in this. This is something they've been testing out when the center position isn't working for them. So Trey going out there and giving you rebounding in that lineup makes that lineup way more effective because that's going to be the downfall of that lineup is they don't rebound and they get burned by opponents big men. Well, if you're rebounding, that's half the battle right there. And Trey is really, really, really contributing in that area. He also had three assists, two steals. As I said, everyone played well on that side. He was good defensively. He's not been great defensively this year. But in this game, he was active. He was using his size. He was trying to force people and not let them go where they want to go. That's what we wanted to see from Trey Murphy. If he keeps doing that, this is why everyone raves about him and thinks there's so much star potential there because of the shooting, because of the size, because of the rebounding now that you're seeing, because of the defense and the flashes that he shows from that. And then on the offensive side of the ball, eight of eight from the free throw line. You know, his mom was at the press conference giving him a hard time for missing his free throws, and he's been real good from then, and she's not going to say anything other than, great job, Trey, after going 8 of 8 from the line. One of the other things you like to see from him in this one was not just the three-point shot. One of the areas I think he can grow his game is tightening up his handle a little bit and having more of a plan when he tacks the basket off of closeouts. Guys comes with closeouts, their arms up, it's not great. He pump fakes and starts to drive. And then usually if someone, at least earlier in the year, would kind of step in his way, he didn't really seem to know what to do. and would kind of freeze and either pass out of it or kind of go at them and it wouldn't result in a good shot attempt. Now he seems to kind of have a plan and maybe he's just processing things a little bit faster, whatever it might be. He looks good when he's attacking those closeouts and getting downhill. You saw the dunks from him, right? You saw him moving off ball in the flow of this offense to try and get open to be able to score. And adding that threat in there is great. And then the three-point shooting, I mean... More of that, please. 36 threes in this game for New Orleans. They didn't shoot the ball particularly well at just 30.6%, but that's better than them taking under 30. That is way better than them taking under 30. So overall, it was a great night for New Orleans, particularly in the second half. Love seeing Trey drain those deep threes as well, getting to the rim, scoring also. Look, it was so good. We got Cody Zeller minutes here. That was fun to see. Let him get out there on the court, though he missed the one-shot attempt that he had. It's like a human victory cigar kind of thing there if uh, you're putting him in the game. So it was great to see that as well for the Pelicans just to get the win and then get the help they needed from others around the league. About as good of a night as it could be for the New Orleans Pelicans. I'm excited, y'all. I hope you're excited, too. And that means I hope you'll come in person to the live episode of Locked on Pelicans that we're going to be recording, streaming live on YouTube as well. Come hang out, ask questions to the Q&A, have a drink, meet other Pelicans fans. Let's get set for the playoffs. More on the playoffs, more on the, the standings and all of that tomorrow, looking at the schedule for some of the other teams, too. That's going to be coming up in tomorrow's episode of Locked on Pelicans. That's going to do it for this episode of Locked on Pelicans. We are part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day day i appreciate y'all so much for listening i'm excited for the rest of the season i hope you are as well subscribe wherever you get your podcasts as always i'm your host jake madison at nola jake on twitter and i'll be back with y'all tomorrow